Hey there, my name is AJ Pickett and I make videos about role-playing games and lots of them. I upload twice a week with a live stream every weekend. You can also find me on Subscribestar, Patreon and Discord, Facebook and Twitter. Also, there is an option to join the channel as a member and I welcome any questions you have in the comments section below. If you like this video or this channel, hit that like button if you would be so kind. It's time to return to our exploration of the outer planes of existence in the classic Dungeons & Dragons cosmology. This time it's to one of my favourites, the heroic domains of Isgard, the plane that represents everything chaotic neutral with a splash of goodness and the great wheel of alignments. Many have said that Isgard is like a whole dimension dedicated to the adventuring life, with infinite adventures, epic vistas, legendary monsters, dazzling treasures, and other less tangible but just as rich rewards for those who dwell there. In a lot of ways, it is the diverse array of inhabitants that makes this plane so vibrant and busy, but also seriously dangerous, as most of them have widely conflicting belief systems and backgrounds which drew them to this plane as departed mortal souls transformed into immortal practitioners. Despite being epic and heroic and despite it being among the upper planes on the great cosmic wheel, Isgard is not strictly speaking one of the planes of goodness. The overall objective of the practitioners and the overall vibe of the plane itself is not one of philanthropy and personal growth. Those who dwell on the plane may tell you they are seeking after some sort of ideal retirement. Some may say that they just want to have a little tavern of their own. Some will say they just want to farm chickens or build their own log cabin by a lake with good fishing spots. But the fundamental truth that is present in all of the petitioners is that this is actually bullshit. They never settled down in life. Even when they tried it for some time, they always ended up going off on one or another adventure, always seeking, always fundamentally dissatisfied with a mundane and uneventful life. And in death, they have come finally to a place which embodies the endlessly rest of and combative, thrill-seeking nature. On the plane of Isgard, if you try riding off into the sunset, you're just going to get ambushed along the way by a pack of trolls or something. Encountering some local souls who are camped around a large bonfire, drinking heavily and wolfing down hunks of spit-roasted boar, they will tell tales of battle after battle, amazing triumphs, crushing failures, and you'll hear th such things as, and then I was hurled from its back, fell into that ravine and got impaled on the blood-hungry valley of giant thorns, or... I don't know where all this meat is going. I've seen my insides enough time t to know exactly how much room there is. It must be filling my bones as well. You see, one of the most famous qualities of the Plane of Isgard is that all those who die during the day are automatically resurrected at dawn. There are some limitations to this, so if they're, it's usually if they're dying in combat. So they can die from assassination or poisoning. You see, in Isgard, nothing stays the same forever. The lands move, the population shifts and changes, the monsters prowl, structures are built and collapse into ruin, and the dead return to life as a matter of course. Most of those who arrive on this plane will find themselves in a landscape that looks a lot like Toril or Kryn or Earth or one of the normal sort of prime material populated worlds, except something like a visit to the Feywild or New Zealand. Everything is dialed up to 11, the colours are more vibrant, the trees are more majestic, the mountains are more soaring and primal, the weather is more changeable and often quite fierce. A storm will always have gales of wind, thunder and lightning, tornadoes and hailstones. There will be constant tremors in the ground, often full-on earthquakes that will tumble down walls and cave in roofs, cause frequent avalanches and high mountain slopes and crack open caverns to reveal new chasms and new passages. The frequent earthquakes will soon become just a background feature of the place though, and the explanation for them will become obvious as soon as one spots a large mass of land drifting overhead, causing a strangely local shower due to the flow of a waterfall high above. Two of these floating earthbergs may crash into each other, causing a hail of actual stones and stormless thunder, and the visitor may come to discover that they just happen to be on one of the much larger islands of stones, itself travelling slowly through an endless sky with countless other such masses. Terrain is highly variable and changeable, of course, so the flora and fauna is, as you would expect, fast-growing and very hardy. One can totally uproot a tree and hurl it across the landscape, and where it lands splintering branches and tearing off roots, the next morning will be a fully intact and standing healthy tree looking like it's grown there for centuries. People chop down trees and use them for firewood and building materials, of course. Seedlings sprout and mature over time, as you would expect, but the plants just happen to be perfectly in tune with the basic illogical and chaotic nature of the plane itself. The native creatures are often quite similar to animals, birds, fish and reptiles of the prime material plane, 
but there are a great number of dire beasts as well as unique monsters and monstrous races. The most famous of the intelligent native beings of the realm they know as Gladshelm are the Barriors. I will have a lot more to say about them later in this video and in later videos, along with the native planar dragon type known as Battle Dragons, which deserve their own video. Personally, I think the Barriors are one of the most well-developed of the non-humanoid planar races and should absolutely be an option as a player character race. Officially, they're perfectly suited for it. I'll also talk about some other impressive races that live in Isgard, including the Eladrin race known as the Fear, and the Eladrin race known as the Gales, who are impressive as hell, and the Holyphants, who look like Loxodons, I'll probably be making a video about them, the angelic beings known as Divas and Planetars, as well as the Divine Lilians, and of course a wide variety of Giants, but mostly uh, Frost and particularly Fire Giants. Most people will associate the Plain of Isgard or Gladheim with the Norse Pantheon, which is fair because they are very prominent as a force there, but there are quite a few divine beings who call Isgard home and even more a diverse array of inhabitants who either did or still do worship a variety of different gods. The petitioners to the plane appear pretty much exactly as they did when they were originally alive back on the Prime Material Plane, the mortal world as they would call it, and they carry on much as they did there as well. They are drawn to this plane at the time of their death because of their independence and grit, their displeasure with the humdrum, their bucking of authority and their never say never attitude. Many of them died in epic battles, and it's that, rather than whether they were in the right or the wrong, that was their ticket into Isgard. Not just because they happened to worship one particular god or another, though, for some, many, that's exactly why they ended up in Isgard in the first place. There are grand feast halls, settlements and farmsteads, forts and even towers or castles, some cities as well, and here is one of the things that, for beings of the prime material plane, often just doesn't make any sense. While the uppermost plane of Isgard at times looks like a prime material world, it really is not. I mean, the plane consists of continent and island sized masses of floating rock that go off to infinity, and yet when prime material plane entities travel the plane, they're never more than a few days, weeks or months away from some named location from myth and legend. Considering one could travel for millions of miles in any direction, how could it be that the well-known locations are never really that far away? Do they travel? Is the infinite space an illusion? Or, as it really seems, is legend and the ideas contained and embodied by the plane far more important than physical laws and logic? The earth motes or earth bergs and masses drift through an infinite void of air. Gravity operates fairly normally, so if one does happen to fall off one earth moat or similar, they will plummet until they hit something below or figure out how to fly, or something either swoops and rescues them or they travel from one mass to another by some other means. One will generally need a method of flight on this plane. It's a good idea, otherwise you'll behold them to whatever transport you can drum up. It also begs the question, with an infinite plane of air, how does the single sun warm all of that air? Why isn't it just a frigid hell all the time? Or why don't the winds and stuff just blast those earthbergs into non-existence? The fact is, it's just fundamentally not the way it works there. Notable locations include Asgard, of course, the largest and most well-known of the divine realms of Asgard and home of the Norse pantheon. Asgard is actually much bigger than most people realize, covering thousands of miles across a massive continent-sized earthberg, which has a massive 80-foot wall and 80-foot uh, high and 40-foot thick wall built around its entire perimeter, punctuated by many gates leading to the flattened peak of Mount Joy and Odin's Hall of Gladsheim, for which the entire layer is named. He also has a hall named Vela Skalf, uh, Thor, Frigga, Balder, Ulla, Forseti and other Norse gods also have their own halls and regions, and then Odin's most famous hall, full of the honoured dead and the Valkyries named Valhalla, or Valhall. The honoured dead have the name Einhara, and it is the goal of many petitioners who reach the plane to join them in the feast hall of Odin. The Norse gods are actually not above the pleasures and lusts of mortals, they're always stirring up conflicts, creating monsters, demanding someone go deal with this monster or that, making and losing and demanding the return of powerful artifacts and so on. Basically they instigate adventures and are most likely behind any large scale conflicts going on as the player characters traverse the plane. So the gods are typically busy with their own deal when not simply making life interesting for petitioners in Einhara. There's also the domains of the elves, uh, named Eilfheim, and the giants, named Jotunheim, and the whole location of the gods outside of their influence, such um, which is known as Vanenheim, and the Norse gods are known as the Vanir. 
It's important to note that this is the D&D version of Norse mythology. You're welcome to make it much more accurate as you see fit. There are other gods in Isgard as well, such as Sulune's relatively quiet realm on a huge earthberg, with a section of the staggeringly huge multi-planet river Oceanus flowing around it, forming an island in the middle which is where her palatial grounds known as the Gates of the Moon stands, which is an important multi-planet nexus, which is also where you'll find the entrance to the infinite staircase, so it's possible to travel to or from this unique transit of demiplane to anywhere else in the multiverse with its own rules and reasons. I've got a video on the infinite staircase as well. Let's see. There is the realm of the god Anhur, named Netaf. Uh, there's Meritet, the domain of the goddess Bast, the safe harbor of the god Valkyr. There's Shondir, the realm of Shondakul, the gnarly wild ride of uh, Tercelis Meunenduin. And there is also the home plane of the god Uthgar, who, with a very large population of petitioners in the realm of Uthgard Helm, which is where Uthgard tribes people when they were alive back in the world of Toril, go to. One question I get asked a lot, actually, is, is there a different Isgard or Celestia or Arborea for each different prime material world? The answer is nope. They all come to the same place. This is one of the reasons the finer details of the mortal existence are washed away from the memories of petitioners when they arrive in the outer plane home. The concerns of the mortal worlds no longer apply to them. They, you know, they've come to a new place, a new start. Another aspect of that concerns resurrections. If their soul is being called back to the prime material plane in their old home world once again, how does the soul even know who the request is coming from or who they are talking about? Good question. The answer is that while a petitioner may not remember much of the details of their mortal life, what they do have a strong connection to is the emotional connection they have shared for the people they cared for when they were alive. And it is this emotional element that guides them. So they won't understand something like, come back, your kingdom of Vanifil is under attack by the Brig Knights of Trag, who have stolen the loot of St. Parmas and set fire to the sacred grove of his temple. They will likely just be disinterested. They don't understand. But if it is phrased simply as, please, my dearest friend, return to fight at my side once more. I can't save your family and mine without you at my side. That is something that will hit all the right buttons and will likely call them back. It depends on their alignment and such, of course, but that's the general idea. Okay, back to Isgard. On the underside of each large floating earthberg, there is heat, fire, and steam. And down below, all of the lowest of the drifting bergs, there is a second layer of Isgard known as Muspelheim, a landscape similar in many ways to the more hospitable lands of the elemental plane of fire. Again, no matter where you are, you're never too far from the notable locations of Muspelheim. Despite infinite distance and the steady movement of rivers of rock and lava that is still the domain of Surtur, the god of the fire giants, and some immortals from the world of Mystara, a fortress built by celestials called the Tower of War Triumphant, it guards the portal to the abyss known as Black Moor. Somewhere on the layer there is said to be a portal to the paramount elemental plane of ice. Oh, and Surtur's realm also contains a portal to the elemental plane of water known as the Silver Eye. There are tons of fire giants living in this lair, perfectly at home, along with all sorts of creatures that love volcanic and parched environments such as fire newts, salamanders, elementals, some Aesir, tons of unique creatures and legendary beasts. The place is just one weird encounter after another with random fireworms and rock crusher serpents, giant volcanic turtles. Feel free to invent all sorts of crazy stuff. This is the plane that is supposed to be packed with crazy amounts of adventure. That's the whole point. The fire giants really do just wake up in the morning, grab their weapons, head out into the wilderness, and fight whatever tries to eat them first. This is sport for them. It's also excellent weapon training and armor testing. It's one of the reasons why you don't mess with fire giants. There's a slew of gods from the Greyhawk setting in Isgard as well. I won't go into each and every one because I really want to give a broader overview of the whole plane, not get bogged down in the tiny details. So what's it like to be there? The atmosphere, you can imagine, is dominated by mineral steams, the clouds and mists from waterfalls that plummet for miles and eventually rain down into bubbling lava rivers or with geysers, mud pools, great spires of dragged ba uh, jagged basalt and obsidian poking up like mountain ranges that got hacked to pieces with axes. The air smells rich, heady, complex with and uh, kind of nourishing intensity to it with lots of oxygen content. Campfires are brighter, explosions are more expansive and impressive. 
The days are only 12 hours long, and so are the nights. The climate shifts from one season to the next over the course of days. So it's more like the normal pace of weather on the prime material world, while the weather is actually sudden and violent. One minute it's sunny and fine, and then howling wind rises and hot on its heels is tremendous thunder and lightning storm that tears trees out of the ground and blasts rocks into fragments. On Isgard, the climate is another heroic challenge to overcome. So instead of a, you know, a cloudy, stormy day, it's suddenly winter. And then the next day it's shifting into spring and then by late afternoon you're getting into summer. The seasons change at the whim of the various gods, which is why they shift around so frequently and randomly. So forget the idea of regions that are always desert, or always snow covered, always tropical. That's just not how it works on Asgard. You could say the terrain and plants of Gladheim are uniformly chaotic as a result. The native races are some of my favourites, but before we talk about them, the last layer of Isgard is essentially the underdark below Muspelheim, known as Nidavellir. Nidavellir's countless passages and caverns are also epic in scope and just as changeable as the rest of the plain. The rock flows and shifts, there are frequent tremors and earthquakes, so the underground wilderness really is dangerous for beings who can't handle rock slides, cavens, digging themselves out of things, sudden airlessness, and rapid shifts in terrain with twists, turns, caverns and chasms and blasts of steam and gas out of nowhere. Most of the intelligent species who dwell in this layer use magic to stabilize their realms, and there are huge populations of elves and dwarves all throughout this layer, but understandably, they will stick to areas where the magic has stabilized things the best. The dwarves are known as the Nidavellir, and the dwarven god Murman Duathel lives here when he's not wandering around, and the dwarven goddess uh, Sharandla has a ring of standing stones nearby, wherever you are in this plane. It's rumoured that the Norse god Hoda dwells here as well, and the city of Ashp uh, Ashbring, also known as the Great Bellows, and the chorus of ringing anvils, is located in the dwarven realm of Nivdavellir. Svartalfhelm is a realm of chaotic, neutral dark elves. They're not drow, but they also count in their number the goddess, the drow goddess Illustrae who dwells there. These Dark Elves are foes of these Guardian Dwarves, but both races tend to prefer to stick to themselves and would rather live and work peacefully than expend any of their efforts and time on pointless wars with each other. Another important consideration is that the most incredible life form in the multiverse is also located on the plane of Isgard. Yggdrasil, the World Ash, is essentially a living transitive plane in and of itself that links the Prime Material Plane with the Astral Plane and the Outer Planes that are involved with the Norse Pantheon specifically. Again, Outer Planes are not required to make a whole lot of sense, so from the perspective of a person standing on an Earthberg in Isgard, the tree can be seen from a great distance. Also, as a whole, the base of the tree will vanish into mists below out of sight. The very top of the canopy will seem to rise above the very sky itself. Yet, despite the location of the tree and the position of the sun, which rises and sets um, in Muspelheim every 12 hours, the tree doesn't seem to cast a massive shadow from any angle. It's absolutely there, and yet almost not there at the same time. The inhabitants native to Yggdrasil are also native to Isgard. So one can encounter the human-sized squirrel folk known as Ratatosk, and one can find blankets and tents made from huge leaves from the tree. And from closer up, it seems to rise 23 miles high, with a 15-mile wide canopy, a 4,000-foot diameter trunk with root and branch sections extending away for 10 miles each, many of them including two-way planar portals out somewhere in the, the outer reaches of the branches. The tree has its own night and day, its own rules of gravity, and its own weather. When you are on Yggdrasil, the size of it seems to expand exponentially. So it's it's got an appearance when you're close to it, but when you're on it, it's different. The leaves at Yggdrasil are not vibrant green, as you would expect. They're actually a blue-black color. The tree roots are technically a part of Niflhelm, and its whole canopy is level with and rises far above Isgard's highest earthbergs. Okay, native inhabitants. The most well described is the humans, of course, but the goat centaur barrior are numerous and truly native to the plain, protecting their homeland from the predations of roaming giants and monsters. A hardy, proud, sometimes vain, sometimes foolhardy, but undeniably brave species, who in my opinion make perfect adventuring planner player characters. Barrior travel freely and widely, it's possible to run into them anywhere in the outer planes and the countless worlds of the Prime Material Plane. 
It's a bit of an injustice that they are not one of the official options as player characters in 5th edition D&D, considering they arrived this in the game back in 2nd edition AD&D in the same manner as the Githzerai and the Tieflings for the Planescape setting books. I'll be making a video about the Barrio, you can be damn sure, that goes into the heritage and culture in some detail very soon. So for now, let's just say that if you intend to stay in Isgard for longer than a short visit, you are bound to meet the Barrio and most likely get involved in their lives, and vice versa. There's also a very good chance that the Barrio friend will follow a player character on their future adventures no matter where they lead, because wandering and facing new challenges are fundamental to the Barrio people's nature. Two special forms of Eladrin, elf-like beings native to the Upper Plains and the Feywild, not just the Feywild, they are particularly native to the Upper Plains, native to Isgard. The Fear Eladrin are broader and much more muscular than any elf. They have a look about them of being very capable of holding their own against anyone in a fight, and yet they're better known for their songs amazing songs, music and poetry. Many would say that the gift of song that the elves have is from their relationship with the Eladrin. The Fear have bright red hair and fiery red eyes that lack both pupils and iris, so they are quite striking and have quite a stunning intellect, devoting their lives to beauty in all of its artistic forms, so they consider themselves living works of artistic expression. They are true warrior poets, and understandably, it's not uncommon for them to form passionate relationships with mortals. I say mortals in the instance that they're referring to prime material plane natives. The fear themselves seem to live forever, but in reality they have a lifespan anywhere from 360 to 550 years. Though, on Isgard, they are likely to obtain magical and legendary means to extend their natural lifespans to an almost unlimited degree. The second group of Eladrin, common to Isgard, are the Gales who are normally thought of as the Knights of the Celestial Eladrin, a powerful race, regal, tall, physically flawless, dark-skinned with eyes like gleaming pearl. Their whole body usually radiates a soft glow. These two greater Eladrin species are exceptionally fast on the feet and unbelievably strong compared to primaterial uh, mortals. They can simply shrug off and ward their allies against the supernatural effects of pure evil, and both races have the power to transform into incorporeal energy forms of scintillating light in the shape of globes about five feet in diameter. As you can imagine, they have the innate power to cast divine spells and can turn any evil creature with just a hard stare at them, or so it seems. Gale are more common on the native plain of Arborea and Arvandor, but they travel to Isgard so frequently back and forth to the Gates of the Moon, I would not be, basically I'd be remiss not mentioning them on Isgard. So they have planner adventuring parties made up of Archons, Avorals, the Elephantine, Holyphants, Demigods, Azimar, Divas and Eladrin, just as the Prime Material Worlds have groups of heroes from different heritage and cultural groups working together to take down monsters. So that's their version of elves, dwarves, half-orcs, that sort of thing. There's loot, great treasures, and of course they have a lot of fun adventuring <laughs> on these planes as well. One of the ever-present threats to Isgard, aside from the giants and monsters, are the trolls. But the trolls of Isgard are quite different from the trolls of the Prime Material Worlds. Here they are known as Fencer, and they're not related to trolls of the Prime Material Worlds at all. In fact, it's quite confusing when you would say, you know, watch out, there's a troll, and they look around wondering what you're talking about. Fencer are far more cultured and intelligent. They range from hideously ugly, huge, and hulking to nearly human in size and appearance. However, even the normal-seeming trolls are very different from humans. They live by night and dine on anything remotely edible, so roots, grasses, bark, scavenged meat, and even some forms of mud and clay are on the menu. The Fencer wear clothes of Asgard, uh, not crude skins or furs. In fact, they're quite responsible for clothing a lot of the people of Asgard, as we'll talk about. They wear helmets, uh, woolen hose and tunics, leather vests, leather boots, and big black rabbit fur hats and uh, are popular among the male fencer. The women wear linen or uh, woolen scales, simple woven dresses and leather shoes. All adult fencer are susceptible to sunlight. They turn to stone if caught in daylight for more than a single round, but this transformation can be reversed with a special substance they make from mandrake root, as well as some other complex ingredients. They are not social creatures, they live in small family groups. Their homes are found in deep woods, rocky sea cliffs, high mountains, and desert heaths, um, or terrain that passes for such. Their homes are half sunk into the earth or extended from natural caves, and uh, 
quite difficult to spot, disguised to look like part of the natural terrain, thanks to the ability of the males to uh, manipulate the earth. Fenceras speak the languages of Isgard, the Lelendi, and the common tongue. They have a fairly uh, high reproductive rate. The females give birth to a litter of two to eight, at least one set of twins in each birth. Uh, to not have twins is seen as an evil portent. They see races that don't have twins all the time as weird. Fencer keep to themselves. They don't have cities. They really uh, interfere in the lives of others and expect their own privacy in return. So they can be easily offended. And of course, they are superstitious. The only exception to this is their fascination. Some would say obsession with the Lelendi. Fencer have been known to kidnap and enslave the snake women. Though the reason is unclear, some believe the blood of a Lelendi is required for the restorative potion that returns stone fencer to flesh, which is quite uh, controversial. Isgardian trolls are on tolerable terms with the dwarves and elves of Isgard. They are considered wise elders by the barrio, who often consult with them on questions of herbalism, diagnosis and treatment, and a little bit of divination. So they're not brutish giant monsters and not evil, although they certainly can be. Their culture has the female fencer in charge of the household and its treasures, particularly the fermented variety. They control the bear and the mead and make a tidy living of its sale to each other, the giants and the Asgardian petitioners. They also weave cloth, particular among the uh, popular among the Asgardian dwarves who trade them forged items for it. The supernatural powers of the male fencer is their ability to transform mud and stone so they can make sculptures if they really want to, but most males have arcane abilities to not understand even basic runes and magic as and to be a male is considered to be unlucky. The fencer males don't do much other than hunt for food, uh, which can also include halflings. I've spoken many times of how ridiculously delicious halfling meat is before. This may seem a bit odd, but most fencier eat primarily roots, nuts, and small game like rabbits, which they cook as meat broth broths in cauldrons. But the species has many quirks. One of these quirks, the female fencer resembles males until they bear their first litter of young, when they become raka, or devourers. Raka increase constantly in size and weight, eventually outgrowing their house and requiring a new one, as the raka can reach heights of 20 to 25 feet and weights of more than 6,000 pounds. Their children strip the surrounding countryside bare, trying to sustain their mother. This transformation is terminal, always. The raka will survive for perhaps two or three more litters and then die. If killed in combat, Raka are capable of unleashing a particularly nasty curse that causes disease or madness in up to seven of the enemies they, that killed her. When a Raka is killed, the whole family group is overtaken by a mourning wanderlust they call the Long Walk. Sometimes they'll travel to another family group and join forces, becoming more rowdy and dangerous the more of them are gathered in one place. Young Asgardian trolls are unaffected by sunlight, which gives them wide freedom to act like hooligans. Packs of young fencers sometimes become a problem, robbing travellers, annoying animals and vandalising small settlements. A lot of the shelters one can encounter in Esgard are actually abandoned fencer troll holes, and you'll be looking for these quite quickly and quite often thanks to the hazardous and unpredictable weather, or being chased by one or another snarling monster or roaming hungry giant looking for some little humanoids to snack on. Most fenciers stand about 7 to 8 feet tall in adulthood. They can hurl stones in a similar fashion to a hill giant and most will carry at least one hand axe or spiked club with them most of the time. I am sure to talk about Isgard in its different realms and creatures far more often when I make video about the barrier and Hollyfint and other creatures soon. So we shall be exploring this remarkable location a bit more. But for now. Please hit the like button if you made it this far, subscribe if you like what I do, check out my subscribe star or Patreon for links to all the full scripts for these videos, buy some Teespring merchandise, wear your geek with pride, and as always, thanks for listening and I'll be back with more for you very soon.